Are you able to see on the top? Are, is the audio uh, being received? Great. Then we're ready to go. OK, so welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. We have our very own Professor Paul Wiseman from the Departments of uh, Physics as well as Chemistry here today. Uh, Paul? Paul uh, did his bachelor's degree at St. Francis Xavier University, St. Fx, uh, and followed that up with a PhD uh, at Western uh, in 1995. Um, he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, at Tokyo University and Nagoya University in 96 to 98, uh, and then a La Jolla Interfaces in Sciences postdoctoral fellow uh, at the University of California, San Diego, 1999 to 2001. Uh, you then went to uh, become an assistant project scientist research faculty member at the University of California, San Diego in 2000, 2001. Uh, and you've been at McGill roughly since then, or? 20 years. 20 years. I just realized it. Is it, is it the exact <laughs> 20 year anniversary of your arrival here? August was the... Very good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So, <laughs> He's had, he's had a number of awards, including the Biophysical Society Young Fluorescence Investigator Award, the Leo Jaffa Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2007, the Principal's Prize for Excellence in Teaching, the category of Assistant Professor in 2007, uh, the Keith Laidler Award for Physical Chemistry, uh, and uh, he is an Automass Chair in Chemistry. So it's a great pleasure to uh, bring to you, Paul. Uh, please take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. And um, wow, it's a pleasure to be in person again. Uh, I think the last time I was in this room, I was teach teaching space, time, and matter. Like, yeah, me teaching space, time, and matter, imagine. But uh, uh, 20 years, uh, I, realizing it's been 20 years at uh, McGill, and I want to talk to you today about some of the stuff we've done in the time uh, since then. In fact, uh, I think the first time I walked into Rutherford, I ran into uh, Peter Gruder. And he said, this must be the uh, candidate because you're wearing a tie. So I didn't wear a tie today. Uh, um, uh, the, the title, Mining the Molecular Noise, Fluorescence Fluctuation Analysis Reveals Protein Interactions and Transport in Living Cells, is uh, sort of a key to what I'm going to be talking about today. Sort of mining information that's in images, uh, so using a bit in terms of statistical physics to figure out what's happening at the level of the molecules. It's also a... Um, a tip of the hat uh, because of my ancestry, because my uh, grandfather was a coal miner in Cape Breton. And so even on my worst days, I'm like, okay. Uh, I know the last two years, I've seen like 20 years, but uh, it's definitely, uh, it's been a pleasure. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some of the things we're doing uh, in uh, the past uh, 20 years. So um, oh, I was looking for a hockey stick with which I can point, and I'll try to keep maintain the two meters uh, uh, distance. The things I'm going to talk about today are how we obtain these vector maps and what they tell us from cells. But uh, the group actually does a variety of other things in addition to fluctuation analysis. Uh, this is a mouse embryo imaged by a light sheet microscope that we built in the lab. So it can do imaging at the cell level or all the way to um, that uh, mouse embryo, obviously not living, uh, is, is uh, about a millimeter in size. And it's imaged uh, volumetrically on the light sheet microscope. Ahmed, who's sitting in the audience, is getting to modify the light sheet microscope to add new capabilities to it. We've also moved from standard uh, diffraction-limited uh, imaging to super-resolution imaging. So this is um, a confocal and a stimulated emission depletion image of um, ion channels on the surface of uh, uh, pulmonary cells. and. Uh, so we're doing more things with super resolution. We also have a nonlinear imaging side uh, to, the, to the game uh, when the, uh, the nonlinear uh, system, the uh, OPO, is working. So part of today, when Bill asked me uh, if I'd give the seminar, I said, sure. I didn't kind of think that uh, I'd be also getting my NSERC RTI grant in today. So it's been an intense, uh, intense day. So it's a nice way to finish. But when that system is working, we can image label-free in terms of uh, uh, extracellular matrix uh, components. We can detect malaria label-free in terms of using third harmonic generation. And do, we've been doing things like virtual histology, where we can image tissue samples in 3D and reconstruct. 
uh, w without using using labels. So this is some work uh, that Ksenia uh, Kolosova graduated the masters in physics here uh, came out uh, last year in terms of an optical reconstruction of a rabbit vocal fold. So uh, in terms of tissue engineering and things things like that. So a variety of things, almost all of them involve uh, imaging with light and microscopy, but I can't talk about everything today, so I'm going to focus on the fluctuation analysis. So I'm going to introduce uh, the fluorescence fluctuation spectroscopy with a bit of background and then uh, explain the techniques from which it was developed and then go on to explain the one which I'd say is the easiest to understand, STICS, the space-time image correlation spectroscopy and show an application in terms of uh, looking at immune cells. And uh, the STICS is easiest to understand because it involves uh, audience participation. You don't have to move, but you, you, will, uh, you will participate in the explanation of the technique. And given time, uh, I should get into the latest applications of these, uh, these approaches in, to examine potosomes in human immune dendritic, dendritic cells. So in terms of the philosophy that kind of uh, approach uh, to the thing, we do rely on the input from biology and from biochemistry, molecular biology, in terms of understanding what the components are that we're interested in inside the cells. But I highlight here the traditional approach in terms of uh, biochemistry, molecular biology, usually uh, involves breaking the cell down into its components and using gels and uh, immunoprecipitation, et cetera, to figure out how much of the different components is, are present. And in certain cases, uh, using co-IP, Western blots, you can figure out what components uh, may be together. But this is important information for building up the understanding of the complex systems that we, when we're looking at cells. But I would argue that gels are very much not the living system. And philosophy which drives our lab is to try to understand the context it, within the context of example, the painting. And I stole this analogy from Alan Howe from University of Vermont, but I really, really love the analogy. It's one thing to know how much pigment or how many molecules are there. It's a totally different thing to see it in action in the canvas of life. And I, uh, Starry Night is one of my favorites in terms of invoking um, dynamics in the landscape. And so what we're going to try to do is to use uh, standard imaging techniques and to pull out information about the molecular components, but to rely on statistical physics to do that. So that sort of drives a lot of what I do. It's trying to be able to do these measurements in living cells. So what is the physics foundation? Well, the techniques I'm going to talk about today are all based on fluctuation analysis. And of course, uh, any uh, physicists study fluctuations in terms of deviations from the mean. Anytime you see delta in a formula, it is simply the value of the property minus the mean of the property defining the fluctuation. And of course, fluctuations are key in noise analysis as a uh, basis of statistical mechanics, understanding why thermodynamics works, and knowing the level, uh, the, the scale at which uh, thermodynamics would stop functioning in terms of macroscopic um, averages. It's also beautiful in terms of the edifice set up by luminaries in the field, in terms of work by Albert Einstein, who thought deeply in terms of what molecules were and understanding aspects of, uh, of the math sort of uh, in a statistical way. Uh, Smolkowski and Boltzmann. Boltzmann, of course, obsessed uh, with uh, fluctuations as well. So the methods are based on an edifice of statistical physics. and. All of this, this uh, these theoretical uh, understanding was around for a very long time, but there were not. Uh, there were only a certain number of experimental techniques that could look at it, including light scattering. But in terms of the field that I'm in, the uh, fluorescence microscopy field, it was only uh, in the early 1970s when these concepts sort of uh, were developed into an experimental technique. So. The, answer, the predecessor of the techniques that I work on in imaging is uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, or F FCS, developed by Elliot Elson, Douglas Magdy, and Watt Webb at Cornell University. And in terms of a setup, it basically involves a laser, which you would uh, focus 
off the uh, bounce off the dichroic mirror and focus into an objective in the sample and focus down to a tight enough spot so that the focal spot is small so the, the number of molecules in the, fo the focus is relatively uh, small and the next slide will expand on that. The molecules under study are fluorescence, so the fluorescence is back collected through a pinhole in a mirror and onto a photo detector. The early, the early 70s they used uh, old photomultiplier tubes, modern uh, instruments used an avalanche photodiode. The signal would be amplified and uh, you would have a hardwire autocorrelator and the fluctuations would be analyzed in, by a time correlation function, which we'll talk about the correlation functions coming up. But what's going on at the level of the uh, molecular level? So within the focus, uh, the focus laser beam, it defines a small observation volume. And if the fluorescent molecules are mobile, here it's sh uh, showing random diffusion, Brownian motion, they emit when they're in the focal volume under ex excitation, but once they exit the volume, they stop emitting. So that will lead to fluctuations, which we can detect if the numbers of molecules are small enough and if the focus is small enough. So here conceptually, and here I highlight the very first reference, it's, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the first paper in Phys Rev Let, uh, outlining, uh, it wasn't, uh, the title actually refers to uh, observing thermodynamic fluctuations. And they actually were examining not diffusion, but binding of ethidium bromide dye to DNA. But the concepts were all built on fluctuations. So if we consider the focus of a laser beam within our sample, and here I'm showing a, a toy simulation showing uh, Brownian motion of the fluorescent molecules. And if we collect the intensity, you, you can see that there are countable numbers of molecules in that focal spot, and we get a time, time fluctuation change, which is reflecting the number of molecules on average in the, in the focal, focal spot. The, if it's ideal, the number of molecules will obey Poisson statistics, and hence, if it's obeying Poisson distribution, the variance will equal the, uh, the mean, so the uh, standard deviation divided by the mean will go over one over square root number of molecules. One over root n uh, behavior shows up uh, throughout uh, physics in terms of stochastic processes, and we are using that to pull out information on the number of molecules. If we can measure the variance in this, we can get out that information. So uh, we've recently had uh, an election, and now we have uh, the, uh, the civic elections uh, coming up. So we've been bombarded by polls during this time. In the polls, they often quote that this, this uh, survey has a 3% uncertainty, 19 times out of 20. That's based on the number of individuals who were polled. What we're doing is saying we're measuring the variance and inferring how many molecules were polled. Okay, so that, that comes out from the one over root n relationship. So the amplitude of the, the fluctuations is one key component. And the other thing that you can notice in the simulation, if you track, you can see that the, ran, the random walkers spend a certain amount of time in the laser spotlight and then exit. The average regression time for a fluctuation will depend on the transport properties. If this was slower diffusion, you would see a longer fluctuation in time. So our characteristic fluctuation time is the other key piece of information related to the transport properties. And of course, defining relative to an average uh, here shown in this time fluctuation record. Is that clear? Okay. Bill. Are there ever situations where the emission is correlated between different molecules and you would get something different from one over square root of n? Um, there are variations on this that look at uh, actually uh, the photon bunching and anti-bunching and uh, that would be a level I'd like to go to uh, with, with the methods. So um, there can be deviations. There were also theoretical treatments in the uh, 1990s the late 80s, early 90s, which to me, it was like, you know, what I was reading in grad school, which looked at non-ideal behavior in these and uh, um, potentials of interactions between molecules and deviations from, from these things. So both, both have been examined. Yeah. So this sort of summarizes the FCS technique in terms of the analysis. 
That fluctuation record is analyzed by a temporal correlation function normalized by the square of the mean intensity. This gives the square relative fluctuation, so at zero spatial lag, that will be, instead of 1 over root n, it's just defined this way to be 1 over n. So instead of 1 over root n, we get 1 over n in terms of the amplitude. And then this will decay according to the transport model, be it diffusion, flow, or a mixture. And you would fit this decay with an appropriate transport model to pull out the dynamics. I'm mainly going to be speaking today about pulling out dynamics, but keep in mind that the amplitude of the correlation function can give you number densities. Now there's an extension, a different from what Bill asked, but there's a two-color or multicolor version where you can collect in two channels and look for interactions between molecules labeled with, say, a green and red fluorophore so that if they're coincident in the focus and they statistically correlate, you can get a cross-correlation function and pull out details on the dance partners. More on that when I talk about the image, image correlation. Now, it's nice to illustrate these things with cartoons, uh, but uh, we keep, and if you're interested, the 1974 paper in biopolymers has a lot of the background, uh, elucidation of the background theory and uh, differential equations, solving the diffusion equation for the different models, all of that. Keep in mind that in at least when we're not doing super resolution microscopy, and even when we're doing super resolution microscopy, we are not resolving the individual molecules. So this is just, I just took Gaussian beam formula and illustrated what a typical Gaussian beam spot would be for exciting uh, a green fluorescent protein molecule with 488 nanometer light. So this would be our diffraction spot, and say if we had on average 10 molecules in the focus, our fluctuation would be defined by integrating the intensity from those molecules, and if everything worked and we took account of noise, the inverse of the correlation function would be uh, amplitude would be 10, the zero leg amplitude. Getting that number out to be 10 is a feat in treating noise and doing the measurement uh, properly. Also, this amplitude is related to how long on average the molecules are emitting in the focus, so there's lots of things that can perturb. And label, fluorescent labels do not always emit, they can blink, or they can uh, undergo photochemistry and photobleach. So it's like the Christmas light which turns out. So if this turns out to the technique, it looks like it's exited the volume. So there's all sorts of things that can perturb it, and we have variations on the method which deal with the photophysics. Peter. So you've got this huge gradient because you're focusing, as you said, like down to whatever, uh, half micrometer, which means there's a huge electric field, no field gradient. So do these things kind of get trapped? Good question. In terms of what would optical trapping work? Uh, studies that have looked at that have not seen aspects of optical trapping for things like, like this. If you, uh, if you look at um, definitely uh, dielectrics, uh, and that can be trapped depending on what wavelengths you're using. And I would say the powers in order to do trapping, uh, at, if you, in the visible, would be highly damaging to cells. So you would be, you would be killing the cells long before you reached a trapping threshold. Okay, so these experiments were not done, at this first you showed were not done in cells, which is a solution and yeah. concentration that determines your 10 monomers, no? Yeah, the first uh, FCS experiments were done uh, in vitro. Okay? And that, so uh, having worked with optical traps, I, um, we usually worked in the infrared, but something to think about, right, in terms of the gradient forces and calculation and, and, and things like that, okay? So, I've talked in terms of the setup, in terms of the FCS technique on which things are based, but I said the methods we work on are based on imaging. So we work with microscopes, optical microscopes, and we're interested not only in temporal correlations, but also correlations in space. So we would use some form of fluorescence microscope, and we've used a whole variety uh, from confocal to photon, uh, total internal reflection, super resolution, et cetera, whatever. They produce an image. And just like on your cell phone, you get an image that is made up of pixels. And our pixel will be our matrix, our image we think of as a matrix of intensities or photon, photon counts, if you're using photon counting detectors. And you, it's, it's a matrix, of course, of pixel, pixel values. That's 
what you're analyzing on the computer, but we have to keep in mind that the correlation is done by the optics, the, the focus, etc. And so that pixel, for the spatial correlation to work, you need to actually have the pixel smaller than the focal volume, so that there is correlation between adjacent pixels and, and that. And that's one of the issues of moving to super resolution with these techniques. You can reach a point where you, you lose the correlation, and you can always put it back in by convolving with a Gaussian. You can play all sorts of games. So here I show a Gaussian beam focus. This would be integrating in terms of over an area. There's correlation between pixels. And we have to know what optics we're doing. We have to know the dimensions of the focal volume in order to interpret and fit specific models in this case. So FCS looked at temporal correlations. What was the characteristic of residency time and the focus? In image correlation, we're going to look at spatial fluctuations in addition to fluctuations in time. So we're going to look across the image in terms of how things correlate spatially. And I'll show data, a variety of data today. Uh, some of it, I think, comes from uh, evanescent wave microscopy. Uh, in biology, they call this turf microscope, total internal reflection fluorescence. You, you bring the laser in, total, uh, be, uh, you reflect off the, uh, the uh, glass interface beyond the critical angle. Maxwell's equations dictate that you must have a boundary evanescent field. That evanescent field excites fluorophores within a couple hundred nanometers of the interface. And what that looks like, if you did wide field fluorescence, you get a lot of background because you have a lot of out of focus light. This is turf microscopy where the fluorescence is restricted to close to the boundary by the evanescent field. We use, again, a variety of things. We have to know what the nature of the point spread function is in each, in each of the cases. But from the standpoint of what I'll show you, just consider that our input is some form of image series. Now, we have a variety, I said, of image correlation techniques. Um, I got an email just before the seminar from Professor Ronis, who asked where the Zoom link was for the uh, thing. And I said, it's, it's actually in person and, and that. But I think it, I said, record it for after, afterwards. With Professor Ronis, we developed case-based image correlation spectroscopy. I'm not going to talk about that today, but it, it is beautiful. It's elegant uh, in terms of the uh, going to case space and then time correlating allows you to separate time-dependent photophysics, like the blinking from space-time dependent transport. So it, it, it gives us certain advantages when we get far more complex uh, fluctuation behavior. But today, I'm just going to focus in terms of applications of the technique, which was the first extension of this that we developed at McGill, so sort of in terms of my 20 years here, space-time image correlation, where we, we're going to uh, talk about that. And uh, if you're interested in uh, the variety of them, Laurent Papa and Trottier, who did a master's here in physics and is uh, now an assistant uh, professor at Concordia University. His, uh, our review back in 2013, New Journal of Physics, outlines different flavors. Okay, so space-time image correlation spectroscopy. And again, this is the easiest one to understand. Input, a region of interest image subseries from our collected microscopy series. We're going to analyze that region of interest by a space-time correlation function. And this was work of Ben Bear, my first PhD student in physics, published back in 2005. So what do we have here? This is just shorthand for a space-time correlation function. We're illustrating with the inner brackets that we're correlating over space, doing spatial correlation, and then doing uh, correlation in terms of pairs of image at different legs in time. So how do we uh, illustrate that without unpacking the equation? I'm going to start the animation going. This should kick in. But this is where I need audience participation. Okay? So some of you may be in different areas of physics, but today you need to be uh, a biological molecule. So everyone in the audience, uh, <laughs> nobody left the room yet. Okay, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, let's say that the Keys Auditorium is the cell. And you are all fluorescent proteins, okay? So we're going to pick enhanced green fluorescent protein, okay? So all of you, 
you're semi-captive now, although uh, it's, it, you, you, know, you, you are free to leave. But let's, uh, if you can stay for the analogy, that would be good. Um, so Bill, who is awesome at setting this stuff up, I've, you know, I, I really felt like I was getting ready for a hockey game with all this, uh, the, this stuff on. Bill arranges for uh, a photographer to take images of the room uh, during this, this section of the presentation. And now, if we do a time series, of the images, each of you are in actually numbered uh, numbered spots in in the room. If we did the correlation in that in that case, the correlation would just be a peak that sits in the middle. If we do the spatial correlation in time, it would be a peak that just sits there and says nobody's moving in terms of the scale of the focus of the system. Okay, and then then uh, let's change it up a bit. Let's say if, it's, if it were uh, traditional non-panoramic times and if you had a distant speaker, there'd be an apreikolok with um, wine served and, uh, and cheese, and I see nodding and that. <laughs> Oftentimes, after the question, there is a mass exodus for the wine and cheese. I think you've seen it or you can remember what it was like, right? Now, Bill is suspended from the ceiling imaging and there's a, a mass moving to, uh, uh, to, to the wine and cheese. Now there's a population, a significant population, correlating as a function of time in a given direction. And if the imaging is done on the right time scale, we get a peak that comes off. And that's a flowing component of the molecules. OK? Right? OK, let's invert it one more way. Let's do a, instead of an apreikolok, let's do a precolok. So let's pop the wine before the colloquium. And uh, instead of mass, we'll hand out uh, you know, blindfolds. So that generates a random diffusion population if the wine is served in sufficient quantities, okay? And so what is diffusion? If you, you know, you look at the diffusion law, isotropic movement, uh, the molecules are moving, but on average, you don't get anywhere. So, uh, so you see in terms of uh, solving tracer diffusion, delta function that spreads out into a Gaussian, the peak stays at the center. That's the central peak that appears after time evolves. There's a peak which spreads, and that, but it doesn't translate off. So that gives us the Brownian motion. And before we said you're semi-captive now, the immobile population would show as the peak staying in the center, and we have to deal with that. And we use Fourier methods to deal, deal with that. Have I missed anything? Ah, uh, yes. So if you're not interested in the biology and biophysics, this may be a seminar where you fall asleep. That's photo bleaching, okay? So, so if you tune out, you, you, you've removed yourself from the population, that changes the amplitude of the engaged population, okay? That's what comes out of solving the space-time correlation function. Is that clear? Okay, so that's, that sticks, okay? Of course, there's more details behind that, but it's the easiest way to understand it. So most of what I'm going to show you today is involving pulling out flows of molecules in cells. And so we fit the translating peak and get a flow vector, but we can also fit the central peak and get uh, a diffusion coefficient, depending on what we're looking at and how we image. So the next slide is showing, uh, just sum summarizing that. Remember, the amplitude of the correlation function tells us information about the numbers. Uh, this is showing in simulation a flowing population that we would track to back up the vector. This is showing a combined diffusion and flow uh, simulated molecular population. Note that the Gaussian is spreading in time at the same time that it's translating. So we can observe what the peaks are doing. We also have a version um, called velocity landscape correlation, where I, I was like obsessing how can we get multiple populations out of it. And actually, because I had to teach space, time, and matter, I got to think about uh, you know, relativity and reference frames and everything like that. And that technique involved considering reference frames and said, if you have a flowing population and you're in the reference frame, the flowing population, it's immobile in that reference frame. So the velocity landscape correlation came out of the fact that I had to teach a course that was not necessarily in my, uh, my, normal, my normal ballpark uh, in that. So uh, always, always learn lifelong learning and, and things like that. Okay, so let's summarize this with some real data. Here's uh, an image series showing uh, a cell expressing a fluorescent uh, protein. This is work with uh, my collaborator, Miguel 
uh, in Spain. Miguel is an Atlet uh, Atletico Madrid fan. I'm a Liverpool fan. Uh, earlier today, I was just teasing him about the outcome of the football match earlier in the week. So uh, he's, he's, he said, I'm not, uh, he, he said, it's okay. Uh, we'll get you in Liverpool. So we'll see. Um, original image series. Immobile filter. So to get rid of, uh, to remove the details of the static population, we Fourier filter in the time domain for each pixel in the stack and remove the lowest frequency component so that we can focus on the dynamics. And then choose a region. Actually, we choose multiple regions of interest. And that hasn't looped, but that was the space-time correlation function. Now, if you had seen, the peak moved off, and we would fit that to get a, a vector out. We do it in parallel across, whoop, I didn't show, you'll see more of these movies. This, the last one didn't play. If you do this for sampling uh, of all sorts of different regions across the cell in time, you can get out a space-time vector map of the flowing population if you've captured on the time scale of the imaging, okay? So a lot of what I'm going to show you is based, uh, based on this, this technique. So let's, with that, it's actually fairly easy to understand the results that I'm going to present in the uh, two stories that I hope to get through. Okay, so we now have looked at sticks, and I'm going to show an application of combining sticks with structured illumination, uh, super resolution microscopy that improves the resolution by about a factor two, applied to lymphocytes and so-called immune synapses. So this is was a collaboration that was done with uh, Dylan Owen who was at King's College in London. He has subsequently uh, moved, switched universities. He's a Manchester United fan. You see all these collaborations come in terms of opposites, uh, in terms of uh, uh, battling over, over things. George Ashdown, his uh, physics PhD student, and Elvis Panjdich, who was a PhD student in, in my group. So this came out of, um, you know, the last two years have been long, but this came out of a discussion. I, we, uh, Dylan and I were at a conference in Hawaii, and you can just imagine what a you know, place to consider, you know, discuss science. And he asked whether we would be able to apply the technique to super resolution data, and I said it depends. It's going to depend on the resolution and the type of super resolution. And he was asking in terms of structural illumination microscopy, where you basically uh, superimpose a structured illumination on the system and obtain more A interference fringes. And basically, you can image the beat pattern frequencies uh, at the regular optical resolution. And in, in Fourier optics, you can see you can get about a factor of two improvement over the diffraction limit through reconstruction of, of this. So structured illumination allows you to beat the diffraction limit by a factor of two. They had this type of microscope, which they were using. And I said, well, that pattern is going to show up in the spatial correlation. But if you know what the pattern is, we should be able to filter that spatial frequency. So again, uh, using Fourier, uh, going to the Fourier domain, we, sh we might be able to deal with it. This is the system. It's an artificial system of T lymphocytes. So uh, uh, of course, type of immune cell placed on a pattern surface where the surface is patterned to present activating uh, um, Proteins in specific regions. Specifically, it's an annular uh, pattern of proteins which would activate uh, the T lymphocytes on the periphery. So here's a, a cell plated, and you can see the fluorescence is brighter around the periphery. It's sitting on a substrate in which you have uh, antigen patterned in this way to activate the cells. Uh, I'm definitely not a biologist, but here's the cartoon of what uh, would be happening here. A normal T cell, which is what you're seeing, would have T cell receptors, which would receive antigen presented uh, by an antigen presenting cell. This would induce clustering and activation of T cell receptors, signaling, etc. ultimately tying down somewhere to the site of skeleton. They wanted to look at that. So is that clear? Artificial substrate, circular annular patterns, the T cells are plated on these patterns and the activation only occurs in the periphery of the cell. While preparing this extra slide, because I realized that it wasn't clear before, I uh, today, I don't know, you know, uh, grant deadline, colloquium, everything, and then you find something new in the literature. 
always beware of your model systems. Uh, I found this paper, uh, uh, Colin York et al, 2019. These were the cells that we used, uh, and these are primary T cells. So the model systems you need to wonder about. Your cats were originally made also in the 70s, uh, collected uh, in terms of a 14-year-old boy. They're a immortalized cancer cell line. So you always also need to ask the question about the relevance of your models in these, these situations. So lifelong learning. But let's look at the data. Here's turf sim, and we're looking at the actin cytoskeleton here in this uh, your cat cell. And you, I think you can see that there's motion of the actin and it's going toward the center of the cell. It's, it's treadmilling there. That was uh, collected by George in London. And if we zoom in, we can do the image correlation on regions of this. So there's a parallel vector map and let's zoom in further. And so there is the output of the space-time image correlation. It's oversampled. So the spatial region of interest for each correlation function is eight by eight pixels, and this is repeated, shifting one pixel at a time. So this is oversampling of the data to reveal the flow, the flow patterns. But you can see clearly the retrograde motion of the actin in that uh, peripheral region, and it's important we had to filter in Fourier space for the, the structural illumination pattern to get out the, uh, the, the details. So this was published back in 2014 as a biophysical uh, letter. The cell edge is out here. That's the direction towards the cell center. So Dylan and, Dylan and I being physical scientists like this, and here's output of the retrograde actin, and you can quantify the actin. And uh, the journal liked the fact that it combined the fluctuation techniques with uh, a super resolution technique, and you could pull out details on the velocity distributions or the speed distributions. This is the angle relative to the cell center uh, centroid, uh, the velocity magnitude distribution, and things like that. However, if you showed this to biologists, they were a tough crowd. They'd say, I can see the actins moving. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> is, is that your only trick? And it's like, <laughs> distribution <laughs> data and stuff. <laughs> Got to do more uh, in that. And to do more, you have to remember that you, everything in biology interacts with everything else. So the last thing we need to understand the data is to do the extension of the cross-correlation technique to color uh, space-time image cross-correlation spectroscopy. Well, the, before you go into yeah. the details, do you understand that distribution and why it looks the way it looks? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll show you changes to it when we perturb the system uh, and that, but uh, um, no, okay. no. And I'll show you where, how it varies and that, but uh, any immunologists in the crowd? Okay, mm -hmm. good, <laughs> I, I, I need to, okay. Uh, so the space-time image cross-correlation. We are now going to collect in two channels, green and red, Green labeling, green fluorophore labeling, one molecule, red labeling, a potential partner molecule. And then you, the traditional way in biology to look at interactions was to take two images in the two channels and overlap them and say, in this case, I see yellow. Okay? But I would argue that that just tells you overlap by sometimes coincidence, especially at high densities. So that's a simulation I did where I simulated a high density in green, high density in red, and overlaid and said, how many of them are interacting? I usually do that when I present to biology audiences. I'm more interested in picking out the couples in this case. And to explain, again, we could unpack the space-time cross-correlation function. Subscript one is channel one, let's say green. Subscript two is channel two red. We're looking at fluctuations. The lag variables are shifts in pixels in space. And in time, we do spatial correlation and then do pairs in time to generate the cross-correlation function. I, my mind is very simple, so I usually think about things in terms of what are the molecules doing. But in this case, I'm going to invoke an analogy from my lab. So um, hockey is uh, almost a religion here, right? And uh, Montreal, at least traditionally, has had a rivalry with Toronto. So, Back in the day, actually I mentioned the kicks technique, the grad student who worked on that for his PhD, Dave Colin, was from Toronto. Cartoons reverse, the cartoons uh, reverse. But Dave was a diehard Toronto fan. 
Peter remembers Dave from some of the uh, retreats and, and stuff. Dave started going out with a Montreal local, uh, Elaine, who was a Habs fan, okay? So the relationship somehow worked. It's, uh, but anyway, they would go to the game together wearing the respective jerseys, and they had complicated relationship rules in terms of uh, no matter the outcome, we have to, at the end of the day, da, 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 da. But if you go to the Bell Center for a Toronto-Montreal game, you see fans of both teams wearing the jerseys. And unlike Europe, where they don't allow the football fans to intermix, Canada allows the fans to intermix for better or for worse. I use this analogy in Germany to talk about football fans, because everyone's like looking at me like it's like there's no couples. They do not, they do not intermix. Uh, I, uh, so anyway, can we pick out the interacting couples? Well, if we think about it from a human sociological perspective or relationship perspective, Dave and Elaine will go to the game together, sit down together, go to the concession stand together, and leave together, and have to admit, uh, Dave would usually be sad, but we can't pick up the, uh, that outcome from, from the technique. <laughs> Statistically, they are correlating beyond random interaction in this case. If you take a single snapshot of just them sitting at the game, and you see them together, you don't know if they're a couple. It's one snapshot in time where they happen to be next to each other. But if you image in space and time, and against the backdrop of all the supporters with both colors, if they are statistically interacting, you can pick that up in the cross-correlation function as that peak. And so we can get the interacting population. That's giving sort of the analogy view. Is that clear on that? So that comes out of the two-color work. And let me just speed this up so that we can get through it. And so in discussions with Dylan, we were wondering, what is that retrograde actin doing? And there were, in the biology literature, there's, there's examples of how the underlying meshwork cytoskeleton can serve to organize proteins in the membranes of cells into domains. So it can serve an organizing function. So we, ex we uh, uh, it was Dylan's group that extended to two color turf sim using uh, Janalia Farms, Eric Betzig, uh, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry in 2014. His group built a two-color sim system that could operate at fairly fast speed. So they booked time on it, looked at the same cells, but now we're going to look at the actin in one channel and a membrane dye, dio, in the second channel. This is the retrograde actin that you've already seen. Everybody, again, remember the biologists were not impressed. I can see the actin moving retrograde. Aha, but biologists, look at this. This is the lipid channel. So what are the lipids doing? Well, ignore the vesicles. You can, you can see, see these. What is happening at the level? And I should say the lipids are in the membrane, OK? Superimpose the two. Here's the two channel. You can see the retrograde actin again. It's only activated in the periphery. What, what is happening? This is where the statistical physics and the correlation functions can reveal aspects of what's happening. Robust retrograde motion of the F-actin, the membrane in the periphery statistically is going retrograde as well. It's noisy because the density of label is much higher. That one over square root n relationship means our fluctuation, our relative fluctuations are close to our noise floor, but we are picking it up. And the cross-correlation is noisy, but you also see that in terms of the periphery. And now, since this is a mainly physical audience, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but Bill, this is what happens if you put the cells on various drugs. Uh, you can see changes in terms of the distri distribution, and then it would be tied into, for example, this is untreated. Cytoclase D destabilizes polymerize, uh, it decreases polymerization, destabilizes the F actin. JASP increases polymerization, so it stabilizes. The retrograde treadmilling depends on a balance between polymerization and depolymerization. Uh, keto cholesterol, this messes up lipid order if lipid domains and nanodomains were playing a role in, in that. And just to show, Here's the distribution of the, the average, the angle distribution relative to cell center for region one in the periphery where activation occurs, and in the center where there's no activation, that's the center random, random distribution when we pick up anything at all. So flat, relatively flat distribution, 
where there's no activation and you can see a clear difference and then you can quantify the magnitudes of the, the different components. If we look at the, again in the cross correlation, this just recapitulates what I've shown before but gives a little more detail. Actin in the periphery, the membrane component in the periphery, and the cross correlation in the periphery. And this is sort of the velocity of correlation in the uh, periphery and the directional correlation or cross correlation in the periphery. So note, you only see it where they're activated. So there is some connection between that retrograde actin and a dye label in the membrane, which is just sitting there like a lipid in, in, the, in the membrane. Okay, so what could be linking them? So we needed to propose what is providing that link uh, in terms of the actin and the membrane. So we know from cell migration that alpha actinin is a protein that binds the bundled actin and the actin filament should be bundled there. So we did an experiment in terms of F actin and alpha actinin and got beautiful cross correlation and again these peripheral correlations and we could quantify the velocities and directions and how it changed as you went from activated region toward the center of the cell. And we were submitting this paper to Biophysical Journal, so we thought this is sufficient. We have a potential linker, we're seeing this thing and it's being revealed by the technique. So we submitted to Biophysical Journal, I told, uh, I, I said this is a slam dunk, but of course there's always referee two, well, you know, it's referee three or whatever, but it was referee two in this case. And referee two said you've only implicated in terms of alpha actin and you haven't really proven it. <laughs> and the editor said, uh, you gotta, gotta answer this referee. So, uh, and, it, and of course that was a microscope at Genalia Farms, so you had to apply for time on it and that, which they did, and Genalia Farms fortunately gave uh, Dylan and George extra time. Uh, I was just sitting back at this point, but uh, George went and did a CRISPR knockout of alpha actinin. So you know the recent Nobel Prize for CRISPR technology used CRISPR to knock out the alpha actinin and uh, then did experiments where now, looking at the peripheral region where you saw correlation before, if you knocked out the alpha actinin from the cell, you got a more flat distribution. So you destroyed the distribution that we saw before. And at this point, then we went back and the referee was satisfied. So we got, we got uh, the paper out. Referees are your friends in terms of actually improving the, the story. That's the, uh, the, the uh, final thing. So I will quickly finish up in terms of the second story can be again understood because you, you've already done sticks. I'm just going to do a twist in terms of what we can get out from radial sticks. And this will be looking at another type of immune system, something called potosomes in immune uh, dendritic cells. So the question is, what is a potosome? Uh, if you are a fan of the classic Simpsons, uh, Kang and Kodos, that's actually a pretty good model for a potosome, as we'll see, uh, in terms of tentacles and a central component. I thought of that today, and then I thought, actually, it applies. So we're going to be looking at systems like this that are interacting. But here is a human immune dendritic cell, and those spots, each of those spots is a potosome. So you can see a potosome cluster in that cell. They function, let me take my broken mask. So they function in sensing the extracellular matrix. So there's actin cores which push down on the membrane and they're connected to cells making decisions about where to secrete enzymes to break down the extracellular matrix. So they have a biomechanical sensory function in sensing the outside of the cell. If we zoom in, there's a single potosome, so about a micrometer in size, an actin core, and an outer ring which has integrins and other adhesive components. And then we show the biological cartoon, which always scares physicists. This is sort of the current picture of what they are. Here's the membrane. Here's that actin core. It's sort of like a cathedral where it's, it's pushing, pushing down on the membrane. These are the, this is the ring, the integrin ring. And then there's actin filaments connecting to the integrins, but there's also actin filaments connecting to other potosomes. So the individual potosomes are connected in a network 
and there's, uh, there's polymerization of actin pushing the membrane to sense the extracellular matrix. And the plethora of uh, named components in terms of different proteins all going in. Let's focus on these actin filaments that connect potosomes. Uh, because a decade ago, everyone was talking about potosomes operating just by themselves. But it turns out, I basically explained that. That just shows, again, the structure that there's a ring and a core. The core is what is, uh, the actin is pushing on the membrane. Previous work by our groups, uh, the, Alessandro Combi's group, my collaborator on this, and other groups has shown that there is connections between uh, potosomes. The group from France, this 2014 Nature Communications, they used AFM to look at connections between adjacent uh, potosomes. Storm super resolution imaging shows the actin filaments connecting each of these centers is a potosome. And we did various studies with sticks and pair vector correlation. This is just sticks in time of a potosomes in a cluster. Can't really, it's hard to see at that resolution, but you could see there's fluxes which correlate with sort of the activity and pair vector correlation, which basically is a dot product of the vector over radial uh, distances and time, would show that there are echoes and the changes on stiff versus soft substrate in terms of where we're seeing the correlations in that. And EM, electron microscopy, and super resolution microscopy showed connections between them. So the model that was emerging was that the potosome cluster was integrated and there's mesoscale regulation depending on the nature of the substrate. And the final work I'm going to show uses super resolution microscopy and live cell imaging to look at this coordination more detail. Um, eight years ago, this is what we were doing in terms of regular resolution. Now, Zeiss Airy scan it uses a honeycomb detector. Again, this gives uh, roughly a factor of two improvement on the resolution. You can actually begin to resolve the actin connecting the two, and it's uh, improved spatial resolution. We can see the individual potosomes. So I love this movie. This is uh, airy scan imaging of a potosome cluster in a human immune dendritic cell on uh, a coated glass substrate. And you can see the potosomes forming, disassembling, and you can see the actin filament distribution changing in time. Does this improve what we can do with image correlation measurements? Well, I'm not going to repeat sticks. We all know what that is. We can do sticks on using the higher resolution microscopy. But now we can resolve the individual potosomes better. So if we take the images and locate the centroid of the intensity peaks for a given potosome, we can locate the coordinates of each potosome in a cluster. I say each. Thomas is in the audience saying, yeah, you had to do that and uh, uh, figure, figure it out. In some cases, we can resolve the individual potosomes. And we can, from the calculated sticks vector, we can calculate the radial component relative to the nearest potosome and get the radial component of the sticks vector for the actin or whatever component relative to the nearest potosome in the cluster. So the radial sticks just takes what we did with uh, the space-time image correlation, and then localizes in a coordinate system of local sources or whatever in terms of the individual potosomes, and we get the radial components as a function as a function of distance from the thing. Given the time, I think I will just show one example uh, of the results we got, and and uh, uh, not doing justice to it, but this is a single potosome. That's the average intensity as a function of time. You're seeing oscillations in the intensity. But if we do the radial sticks on individual potosomes, what emerges is that you end up seeing fluxes in terms of inward and outward relative to individual potosomes. And this behavior can change on, uh, in terms of on substrates of different stiffness, et cetera. So I'll just flash the periodic results. So Thomas calculated in terms of for a single potosome, total number of vectors toward or away as a function of time. 
This is a biological sinusoid. Uh, over time, it's changing from inward to outward. And you can, uh, again, uh, within the, the noise of biology, this is a sinusoid, right? Uh, actually, be interesting in terms of doing some frequency analysis on this. But uh, the periodic oscillations of actin flux, inward and outward, are roughly out of phase by, by pi radians. And uh, in terms of uh, the, this, this periodic, periodic behavior. And I think, given the time, I won't go into the details of that we also examine this on soft versus stiff sub. Actually, I'll finish with that, and I won't do the two, two color. If you look, uh, well, this is, this is two color in terms of actin and vinculin. You can look in a two color uh, cross analysis and look at changes in terms of the, the uh, flux uh, velocity inward and outward averaged over protozoan cluster and see changes on the different substrates. So given the time, I think I will wrap up at, at that point. But just to summarize on this, we are looking at the aspects of the biomechanics, how it changes on different substrates, and trying to understand aspects of that model in terms of a dynamic model which uh, goes beyond what is, what is understood now. And we're, we're working on a paper for Biophysical Journal on that. So let me just get skip ahead to and we also look at the phase differences and, and that. So, uh, and we're also looking to look forward to see if we can do force sensing on the, uh, the substrates and that. But again, uh, mining the images in terms of fluctuations and uh, I just, the uh, final acknowledgements in terms of the second story. Um, the Potosome story was collaboration with Prof. Alexander Combry at Radboud University Medical Center and Dr. Kuhn Vandenries. Uh, former grad student Marilyn Elvis did some of the earlier work that I showed, and Thomas uh, Mosier is a master student in physics uh, who uh, did the radial sticks and all of this analysis, and I didn't do justice to that because of time. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my research group, current uh, and past in 20 years, and colleagues here at McGill. Uh, I'm, I, I'm thinking back to the, the first interview days and that. And yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks for, thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Um, so now I think we'll have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we're right about up at time, but there should definitely be time for two or three questions from the audience. I can start maybe. Sure. So you talked about using super resolution microscopy methods. Uh, what would limit the spatial resolution if you did that? And then my second question is connected. Uh, what limits your temporal resolution, and can you access all the time scales of interest? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you hit on the holy grail of what everyone in the field wants. So uh, th those in the field want the ultimate resolution with the ultimate time resolution. And they talk about a triangle in terms of the temporal, spatial resolution, uh, and also being um, not killing the, the cell. So the STED technique I mentioned at the beginning, you can ramp up the power and improve the resolution, but ultimately you fry your, your, your cells and that. So there's, there's always, uh, always changes, uh, there's always challenges. In terms of the spatial resolution that you can get, it depends on which method you, uh, you, you use. And um, I showed you a storm, that's stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. That one, that one's static, they're fixed cells, and you just collect photons and you just improve the, uh, you're, you're isolating the mole molecular peaks iteratively, and you can get very high resolutions on the, you know, 10 nanometer, 10, you know, 10, 15 nanometer scale if you collect enough photons, but it's, it's not, it's not dynamic. It's only the photo blinking in terms of the thing. Mm -hmm. The techniques I showed improve the spatial resolution by about a factor of two over diffraction, which puts us in a pretty good spot in that we still have enough pixels that we can calculate the spatial correlation functions, yet, for example, in the last example, begin to actually see the pot individual potosomes uh, separate so that Thomas could do the radial, uh, the radial uh, sticks on it. And the temporal resolution, it comes down to photons. Mm -hmm. Always comes down to photons in terms of your probes and what you're collecting and what 
um, a lot of people forget in the super resolution techniques is in some cases you are losing photons in terms of uh, what you are collecting. And so, you, and especially if you're doing quantitative work, you really need to pay attention to that aspect of, of things. So it's not just a pretty image. If you're trying to mine it for quantitative information, you really have to pay attention to those things. And Stefan, Stefan Hell has like a new technique, uh, um, you know, uh, MinFlux coming out, which is pushing the limits even further, uh, but it involves tracking and uh, it, it will remain to be seen uh, whether it's, you know how far that one can be extended, so there's 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 still ways ways to go on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll run to you with the microphone just to make sure that you're recorded on the video. Please. Thank you. Uh, you don't uh, have to. All right. Be okay. too close. Uh, so, thank you. Very, thank you very much for the talk. I I'm actually from chemistry department, so my question will probably sound very naive to the physicists. Um, so my question. It's about the cross uh, the cross correlation study where you introduced the analogy of two two hockey fans. So I I did a quick look up. It seems like uh, something called triplet correlation function also exists. So yeah. so I'm wondering what so I'm wondering would it be possible to extend uh, from a two body couple system to a three body system? Um, and then would it be possible to apply the same idea and but analyze a more complex a more complicated system? Yeah, so um, I need to clarify, because I'm also in chemistry. When you talk about the triplet, are you talking about triplet state or three body? Uh, three body. OK, because yeah, there is a way of doing this at the FCS in terms of the actual triplet state dynamics on a, a faster time scale. But yes, you can extend this to uh, three body. Uh, Petra Schwille, who is um, a, a major, fi uh, major figure in terms of fluorescence correlation, published with Katrin Heinz, who later postdoc with me, a three-color correlation using quantum, na quantum dot nanoparticles, because they could use the narrower emission of the quantum dots to spatially uh, separate in the, sp the visible spectrum three different components. The question then became, quantum dots were fairly large. How much was that perturbing the system? In principle, yes, you can, you can do the three-way correlations. The things you have to worry about get to be challenging. Uh, let, me, let me just put it this way. The bleaching rates can differ between the two channels, which will change interpretation and change things in time. The, uh, so the, uh, the, the behavior of the different dyes can, can vary and stuff. So in principle, yes, it can be done. As you add more layers on, there are more things you have to worry about in terms of control in the care of experiments. So in principle, yes, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Thank okay. you. And Peter? Great, thanks very much for a nice talk. So in terms of biology, or just in terms of actually getting a model that makes quantitative predictions or so where you need your quantitative input data, does this, has one made any progress? Or does, this one, does, this one, does this allow one to put biology on a kind of, you know, Circle cow approximation level kind of thing, or I would or love is to. It's just that kind of nice. I, I now know it flows at five nat micrometers, and these two guys dance together. But so what? The 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 that would where where we would like to go. So one would really like to be able to start to build models which make quantitative predictions, and. The work that I showed in terms of that Thomas did, we, we had a Zoom meeting uh, with Alessandra and Kuhn, the, bio, the immunologists and biologists on this, the other day, where we were beginning to try to piece together a model in terms of the biomechanics, and then ask questions about some of the other components, how they should behave in, in this. So that's a direction where I think would be valuable for biology. And I think the challenge becomes, you've seen the number of components in there. So it, it becomes uh, the question of how many, how many people doing, doing the thing, but you know, working on the thing. But that is where I think is going to be beneficial to go with, with some of those. And we're, we're, we're trying to tease out some of these things and make, make a prediction, especially now that we're seeing these periodicities and stuff and what's changing them. Can we perturb specific? specific things, how does that change the model? But we're in the infancy in terms of 
<laughs> actually, uh, yeah, we had to end the Zoom meeting and, and stuff. So we were, uh, we were like just beginning to think about some details. But I think that's where it, uh, it, it would be useful for the field to move in that direction. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're just about past time. So let's thank Professor Wiseman one more time for a very good collection. Thank you. Please come back next week. We'll have a guest from computer science. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend.